dare to say the word. As for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. When the dark red sea of doubt billowed in our way, then he parted every wave, so he will today dare to stand like Joshua, dare to say the word. As for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. Just before us, Jordan rolls just across the way. We can safely trust the Lord. He shall lead today. Dare to stand like Joshua. Dare to say the word. As for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. All right, good morning, everyone. Tired this morning. I understand the heat has been pretty hot here in Harlan Gin, but I want us to keep singing to keep serving this morning. You know, sometimes when people sit down when I talk, it makes you think I'm going to be long winded. It's okay. Uh, but we're glad you're here today. I think the only announcement I have this morning is that next week on uh, we are going to have a potluck service immediately following our worship services. So bring your favorite meal or side dish to share with others. If you have any questions, you can uh, talk to Kathy Fox. Kathy, if you just want to wave your hand real fast. Uh, and so we would encourage you to come join us for that. And even if you forget to bring something, uh, the importance about potluck is fellowship. Uh, I will be the first one to eat all the banana pudding if it is made, but it's really all about the fellowship. But we want you to join us for that. That's all the announcements I have this morning. I'll hand it back off to Arnold, who will keep leading us in songs. All right. Let's keep singing, and I'm going to ask you to keep standing if you can. If you can't, I understand. I'm satisfied with just cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. In that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder, we will never more wander, but walk the streets that. me poor or deserted or lonely I'm not discouraged I'm heaven bound I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city I want a mansion a robe and a crown I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow be seated. Thank you. <clears throat> this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. 
If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Father, for this church family that meets here. Father, for giving us this first day of the week that we come and come together and worship you, Father. Thank you, Father, for all our blessings. Thank you for all you do for us. Especially, Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who is willing to die for our sins. Father, we pray for those that are not with us, those that are traveling, may they come back to us safely, Father. Father, be with those that are sick this time, those that we may be aware of and those that we do not know of, Father. You know who they are and you know what our needs are, Father. Father, we just ask you to continue to be with us. Keep us safe, keep us free from danger. Thank you, Father, for this church family that meets here, thank you for our elders. Thank you for Trevor and Beth. Finally, thank you for Arnold that leads us in, in songs this morning. And for those, Father, that work here with us, Father, that we may not be aware of. Bless us all, Father, see our needs. Continue to forgive us, Father. These are prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight I shall roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. <clears throat> I gotta ask you to stand for this one. You gotta get some air in your lungs, you know. You got to open up your mind to this song and need to open your spirit and your understanding as we sing. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God that the people shout. From the 
depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout Be seated. <clears throat> it's the time of our service where we take of the Lord's Supper and we remember that great sacrifice that was made for all of us. And so as we uh, take of the bread, will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for all our many blessings, but most of all, remember this great sacrifice as Jesus Christ, our Savior, was whipped and beaten and nailed to the cross through his hands and through his feet, and he did that for us. And so, as we remember that great sacrifice, May we set aside our wants and our worries and just remember and reflect on that great sacrifice. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Will you pray with me? And again, dear Heavenly Father. As we take of this fruit of the rind, which represents the blood that was shed on the cross for the sins of the world, as we do this, we remember that great sacrifice. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now we'll say the blessing for <clears throat> our contribution. And there's a box been laid in the back, and there's one in here in the foyer for you to... Uh, contribute so will you bow with me and pray Heavenly Father we thank you so much for all our many blessings and we acknowledge that all we have comes from you and that we've been blessed beyond measure so as we return a, a portion of that we do so with a grateful heart in Christ's name we pray Amen Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again <clears throat> past and whatever lies be <clears throat> sing it when the evening comes bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul My strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing his praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Bless
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. Be reading this morning from the NIV. Matthew 25, verses 24 through 27. Then the man had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. The master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should put, shall put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, guys, I feel that that was like, we were like a 65% at the start of service, and now we're at like an... 78% and so I want all of us every week to be passing with at least a 90 uh, so let's try that again good morning everyone good morning. all right guys I like that. that's what I like to hear uh, recently Annabeth and I watched the movie cheaper by the dozen and if you don't know this movie it's a great one it's a classic and the story is about Steve Martin and his wife and they have 12 kids and what their life is like and so for much of the beginning of the movie their focus is on their family after Steve and his wife get married they have many kids uh, and Steve's job is that he is a division three football coach and he's always had dreams of going back to his alma mater in Chicago where he could be a division one football coach but it never really worked out for him so for years he's in this smaller town coaching a Division III football team and he wins Division III championship year after year after year. His family is very tight. They all love each other. They're having a great time. But as I said, Steve always had this dream of coaching a Division I football team. Well, after most of his kids are, as they're growing up and his, his first kid is out of the house and he has teenagers and kids in elementary and just even little tiny kids, one of his friends from his alma mater comes to him and says, Steve, we want you to coach our Division I football team. And so this was Steve's dream forever. And so his focus was on first his family, but once he gets the call, they decide to move him and his entire family from the country into the suburbs of Chicago. And so Steve tries to balance his focus on this football team, but also his family. And not even two minutes after his family has moved into their house and they're unpacking boxes and the kids are going everywhere doing whatever they're doing picking their rooms Steve gets a call from the school saying that they want to have a press conference and so Steve answers the call and he goes off to go work on the football team you can already see his focus starting to shift and then a few days later after they moved to Chicago Steve's wife gets a call that the book she's been writing is out for publishing so she has to leave her family in Chicago and go to New York for about a week so even the mom's focus is really on her family. It's what she wrote her entire book about. 
but her focus begins to be on this book. And for the rest of the movie, there's this back and forth between Steve trying to work on his football team and he has to help them, but he also has to help his family integrate into a new school, a new place, a new city. And there's this constant war of, do I help my football team or do I help my family? And so Steve's focus goes all over the place and eventually it goes, well, not very well. And a decision is, is given to Steve. He can either continue being a Division I football coach, or he can choose to focus on his family. In our lives, our focus is pulled in many different directions. And for all of us this morning, when we talk about our theme this year has been community. And so what does that mean for us? We've kind of lost focus a little bit there as well. But I want to reintroduce this idea this morning because I want us to think as a community, as a church, what is our focus? What should our focus be in our community? How should we share Jesus? And so this morning, I want all of us to refocus on ourselves, on the work of this church in our community as we read a story about a king who refocuses people, turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 14. <clears throat> As we start, I want to read 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verses 2 through 7. <coughs> I think my throat needs to refocus this morning on speaking. Uh, but if you're looking for 2 Chronicles, it's in your Bibles, it's in the New Testament, after the book of 1 Chronicles. And now let's read about King Asa. It says, Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars and the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his laws and commands. He removed the high places and incense altars in every town in Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. He he built up the fortified cities of Judah since the land was at peace, and no one was at war with him during those years, for the Lord gave him rest. Let us build up these towns, he said to Judah, and put walls around them with towers, gates, and bars. The land is ours because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him, and he has given us rest on every side." So they built and prospered. In 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verses 6 through 7, and my best Spanish this morning tell us this. Asa construyó en Judá cuidades fortificadas, pues durante esos años el Señor le dio descanso y el país disfrutó de paz y no estuvo en guerra con nadie. Asa le dijo a los de Judá. Reconstruyamos esas cuidades y levantemos a su alrededor mur murallas con torres, puertas y correjos. El país todavía es nuestro porque hemos buscado al Señor nuestro Dios. Como le hemos buscado, Él nos ha concedido estar en paz con nuestros vecinos. Y tuvieron mucho éxito en la reconstrucción de las cuidades. Asa was, as we read in our Bibles, Asa was a good king. And it's kind of hard to follow in the Bible sometimes all these different kings. We have the people of Judah, we have the people of Israel. But what we see here is that Asa was a good king. And it's not that Asa was a good king because he had these great qualities, which I'm sure he did. And Asa wasn't just a good king because he was handsome. I don't know if he was or not. But we know that Asa was a good king for what he did. He took the people of Judah and made them better with God. The kings before Judah, before Asa, really weren't that good. You had Rehoboam, and Rehoboam did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord, because it starts out with Rehoboam going to the elders of the community and asking for their advice. And after getting their advice, Asa goes to his friends who are closer to his age, and so 
he decides to ask his friends for advice, and his friends give him the opposite and worse advice from the elders. And so instead of listening to the wise elders, Asa listens, to, or sorry, Rehoboam listens to his friends, and he makes life in Judah very hard for them. He then goes off to construct these high places, these altars, these Asherah poles, which would have been images to foreign gods, and he introduces them into their temple and their worship. And so Rehoboam is pulling his people away from God. He's giving them distractions instead of following Yahweh. He was not a good king. And then before Asa, you have Abijah. And Abijah wasn't a great king either because he followed in the footsteps of his father. He could have chosen to put his foot down and said, we're not going to do this. We're going to follow God again. But he just kept going with the status quo. He didn't do anything different. And then you have Asa. And Asa comes in and he steps up and says, we are not going to do anything but follow God. And what we see in this passage is that Asa refocused the people on God. And I can't remember how many years it was between when the people of Judah had, had followed God to when it was Asa, but it seems like many things have shifted in their culture. When Asa says, we're going to follow God, he doesn't say, we're going to follow the Lord our God, but he says, we're going to follow the God of our ancestors. It's been some time since they've actually followed God. and see, So he essentially reintroduces God to them again. He gets rid of the high places, the altars, the Asherah poles, anything and everything that could distract the people from God, he got rid of them. Because he knew it was much more important to follow God than to follow, it was much more important to follow God than follow other gods. And what we see here, because they followed God, it says they have peace. Their city was rebuilt, it was fortified, and it was strong. And we might read into that and say that if I follow God, I'm always going to have peace. I don't think that's the case. But what I think we can pull from this passage is that if we follow God, if we make him our focus, we will have the best possible future that we can have. It may not be the one we imagine, maybe the one we have pictured for ourselves, but I can promise you, life with God and your future is better with Him than without Him. We all need to refocus on God. And we need to learn from the people of Judah because they made God their focus. The rest of the sermon is about to get a little bit heavy, and I wanted to warn you about that because I'm going to say some things, but and if I'm stomping on toes or hearts, know that I'm also talking to myself here. Because we have a greater calling in this world. It's not to be an American. It's not just to be a good person, but it's to be a Christian. It's to be a follower of God. And sometimes along the way, we get distracted, and we have to refocus just like the people of Judah had to refocus. So this morning, I want us to look at as we go forward on what it means to refocus on God. And we're going to look at that by looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 15. We're going to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 15, just starting by verses 8 through 12. And this is what our Bibles tell us. It says, When Asa heard the words and the prophecy of Azariah, son of Obed, the prophet, he took courage. He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. He then assembled all Judah and Benjamin and the people from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon who had settled among them for large numbers had come to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him they assembled at Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of Asa's reign at that time they sacrificed to the Lord 700 head of cattle and 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder they had brought back they entered into the covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and soul. When we talk about refocusing, in order to refocus, sometimes we have to be reformed. 
And what I mean by this is if you look at the people of Judah here, for a long time they weren't following God. For a long time they were doing what they wanted to do, but they had to be reformed into following God. It says that Asa took all the people he had, even those that came to him from the cities that he had conquered or from Israel, and he said, we are going to follow God. It says that they pledged to follow God with their heart and soul, with everything they had, they were reformed into God's image. All of us are image bearers of God. We show God to the world, whether it's good or bad. And sometimes when we fall off the path and do things we shouldn't, we have to be reformed into Christ's image. When I was in eighth grade, I had to take an art class. It was part of the curriculum. But I want to tell you, I was terrible at art. The best that I could do was draw stick figures, and we had to paint, and the worst thing we had to do was work with clay. I am not an artist. The best thing I did, you would probably find in Goodwill, and they would probably make you pay negative $2 for it because they would pay you to take it. It was so bad. But I remember that a part of that art class is every kid got two or three days to work on the potter's wheel to try to make a pot or a bowl. I think I got a week and a half of the potter's wheel because it just didn't work out. And I remember every time I would get my piece of clay, I would throw it down on the potter's wheel, I'd get it to stick, and then I'd get it wet, and I would start to form that pot or bowl, whatever I was trying to make. But then eventually I would get distracted and I would lose focus, and then I'd poke a hole in the side of my bowl. So I had to take my clay lump, reform it back together into a ball, put it back down on the potter's wheel, and try again. And I told you it took me a week and a half to get something. I think by the end my bowl was maybe like half an inch tall. It was more like a plate. It was, it was not good. But time and time again I had to reform what I was trying to make. When we are following God, we might have to be reformed into him, His image, and that might take some time. In our lives, we should only know one life, and that is life with God. But as people, we're really good at compartmentalizing. We have our church life. When we come to church, there are many of you who are here now, some of you are watching online. We come to church, we come for worship, we come to Bible study, and it's really easy to have our church life. But then as soon as we leave the doors, we have our driving life, where we can get pretty mad sometimes. We have our home life, where we might act a certain way at home. We might have our school life, where if we're around our, our school friends, our teachers, we act a certain way. You might even have a work life, where you act a certain way around your coworkers. Sometimes you might have a neighbor life, where you act a certain way around your neighbors. You might have a, a community life, where you act a certain way around your co-worker or your, your community or however it is, but often those are all separate lives and maybe not all of those lives include God. There can only be one life in this, there can only be one God in our lives and there can only be one life with God. You can't go off and act a different way in your life and not include God in it. When we are with God, we are either with him 100% or we're not with him at all. So maybe this morning as you're thinking about yourself, you've realized you haven't been following God like you want. You want to be different. Maybe this morning you need to be reformed as you refocus on God. And that might take a lot of introspection, a lot of prayer, and a lot of study. But maybe this morning that's what you need to do in order to refocus. You might have to be reformed along the way. But if we keep reading our Bibles, I want you to see what the people of Judah did. In verses 14 and 15 of 2 Chronicles 15, it says this. It says, They took an oath to the Lord with loud acclamation, with shouting and with trumpets and horns. All Judah rejoiced about the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. They sought God eagerly, and he was found by them. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. 
I hope you see this morning as you refocus that God must be our only focus. God must be the one thing that we are focusing on in our lives. In 2 Chronicles, they were making sacrifices. It says they sought God wholeheartedly. They pledged to follow God with their hearts and their souls. And, their, and I'm going to say minds in there too because you know, that sounds good. But they were seeking God with everything they had because he was their focus. They didn't make a decision on their own, but they made a, a de decisions because God was leading them. In your life, God must be your only focus and everything will flow from it. We need to be thinking about things that are, have wisdom from above instead of wisdom that is here on earth. Am I seeking out things that are going to glorify God's kingdom or am I going to seek out things that are going to glorify myself? Because in our lives, there are many distractions that will pull our focus away from God. And we can choose to follow those or we can choose to continually follow God in everything we do. Because we might not think that we have lost focus sometimes. Sometimes we may not even realize that we're doing it. But even sometimes in church, we can lose our focus. I remember it was, it was some weeks ago. Annabeth and I had gotten here. We were getting set up for church. And someone walked into the auditorium and I asked them how they were doing. And they said, there's no coffee this morning. And I just want to say, take a moment right now, I want to thank all of you who have taken time to work in the coffee room, put your hearts and your souls and your own personal funds into that, because that is great, and we really appreciate that. But there was one Sunday that I guess the coffee wasn't available, and so this person was very upset they didn't get their coffee and their donuts. A few minutes later, someone walks in, and I ask them how they're doing, and the same thing. <sighs> There's no coffee this morning. I remember walking out into the auditorium, same thing. People are saying, did you hear there was no coffee this morning? I mean, can you believe it? I, I didn't even get my donut this morning. I, I count on that for my, my square breakfast every day. It's what I need to get me going. In Bible class, I heard the same thing. There was no coffee. There was no donuts this morning. I get to worship. People are still talking about the fact they didn't get coffee and donuts this morning. And while it's a funny thing to think about, I can tell you that many people that morning didn't seem to be focused on God. The Bible studies we were having, the worship we were going to do, they were so focused on the fact that people didn't get their caffeine and sugar, and yet we weren't here to focus on worshiping God. That's a problem. Are we going to care more about the fact that we didn't get coffee this morning? Are we going to care about the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of people out there in the community that do not know Jesus who are going to die without him because we haven't taken the time to share his loving meshes with them and because they could be the one person that needs to know Jesus just like we, just like we want to, but we don't share it with them because we're too uncomfortable. Where is our focus in all of this? Is it a focus on petty things or is it a focus on the things of God? Is God your only focus? This morning, this is one last one point I want to make. And it's that often refocusing can be painful. If we read here in 2 Chronicles 15 verses 13 through 16, I want you to see what Asa did. It says, all who would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, were put to death, whether small or great, man or woman. Down to 16, it says, King Asa also deposed his grandmother, Makah, from her position as queen mother, because she had made a repulsive image for worship of, the, of Asherah. Asa cut it down, and he broke it up and burned it down in the Kidron Valley. When you refocus, it might be painful. You might have to give up a lot of things that make you feel real comfortable, that make you feel real good. But sometimes those things aren't godly things. As you refocus and you're looking on God, it might be painful because just like with Asa, there might be some people you have to cut off from your life. If you have friends, even family, that are pulling you away from God, that aren't helping you glorify God, you might need to take a break from them. I'm not saying you can't have friends or family that are non-believers. Maybe those are the people you need to share Jesus with. But if you have people time and time again that are talking wrongly about our Lord, who are defacing God, using his Lord's name in vain, and you are silent, silence is acceptance that you're saying it's okay. 
you might have to, to have to step up and say, actually, you need to step up and say, that's not right. You should stop talking in that way. Or if they keep doing it and they won't drop it, you're going to have to tell them, I'm going to have to leave this relationship for a while because nothing should get in the way between you and God. Refocusing might be painful because you might realize you have to give up your time. We all covet our time. We want to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it. But maybe as you're refocusing on God, he might be calling you to serve in the church, to serve in the community, to get involved, to, to help out in ways that glorify God's kingdom. He might even call you to, to help someone just in the store, get something off the shelf, just something small, but it's ways that you can glorify him. You might have to give up your time. Or I know a lot of us like to be comfortable. It's really easy to sit here on Sunday mornings to listen, to worship, to sing, to pray. But when we have to go outside in the heat and talk to other people about God and inviting them to worship, that makes me feel real uncomfortable sometimes, and I don't think I can do that. You might have to give up your, uncom your comfortableness to be uncomfortable so others can find comfort in knowing God. Refocusing might be painful for you. As I said, this is something that I want us all to think about as we go forward because our focus should be on God. And if our focus is on God, he should cause us to further his kingdom. This morning, I want to leave us all with this question. Is God my focus? If you believe God is your focus, then you better be acting on it. You better be listening to the Spirit that's guiding you and following Him wherever He takes you, even if you're scared to go. You're not sure if that's the right place for you. If He is your focus, you will go anywhere with Him, and God will work through you. But if God isn't your focus this morning, you want help, you want prayers, He can be your focus. If there's anything you need this morning, please come as we stand and sing. I can't help myself. <laughs> what a tremendous exhortation that we need, that I need. As, as he was talking about refocusing, as Trevor was talking about refocusing, I wish Marilyn was here because she knows about focus, binoculars. <laughs> and if you don't refocus your binoculars, you're not going to see what you're trying to see clearly. And that's what happens in our life. That's what happens in my life. All of a sudden, God becomes fuzzy and we leave it alone. And we go about our life because we have other things in focus that we dwell upon, sadly. We have Bobby, Ernie, and Wayne here as elders. And I'm going to ask them before we start singing to go ahead and pick a door. And if you need prayer, share it with one of your shepherds. If you need prayer, let us know. If you need some study in some area, let us know. If you're a visitor and want to know a bit more, definitely let us know. I will be hopefully roaming around here. We're not a whole bunch of people this morning. And that's the other thing. Please don't just <laughs> skedaddle. Um, let's get to know each other a little better. This song has a different course. Do we have the other slide? Is Ben back there? Was the slide there? Well, the, the initial slide, just as I am, uh, I come broken. Yeah, I come broken. That's the, the second part of this song. <clears throat> Sometimes I struggle with it. You guys know it. We put it on Facebook so you'd get to know it a little bit more. You please sing it louder than I sing it. <clears throat> Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to
Just a second. I told you <laughs> this song is sung by ladies, and uh, us guys have to bring it down at least one octave <laughs> uh, to try and sing it. I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm welcomed with open arms, praise God, just as Dear Father in heaven, holy is your name. Uh, thank you for the time we've had to worship you, and I pray that it's been acceptable to you. I want to ask you to guide us in refocusing our lives on you. Uh, and just be patient with us as we try. Uh, I ask you to be with uh, our first responders and our law enforcement and the Border Patrol and the military be with them as they go about their duties, keep them safe and get them home to their families. I ask you to be with those that are having health problems and any type of problem that they, uh, they're having. Guide them and guide us in helping them. In Jesus' name, amen. 